looks like everybody's here and it is 5.30. So with that, I'd like to convene this meeting of the San Lorenzo Valley uh, District, Water District Board of Directors for November 3rd, 2022. And we have a roll call vote. Not vote. President May Just roll call. Roll call. <laughs> President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulls. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the closed session agenda? Staff has none, Chair. Okay. This is the time where we would have oral communications from members of the public on the uh, topic that will be covered in closed session. Holly, do we have any members of the public in attendance? We do. Okay. I have a feeling that they are not going to really need to be here until 6.30, but. Uh, I think so too. So yeah. Jenny and Tony, um, I think uh, as I, Tony, you're, thank you for getting here early, but uh, you need to come back at 6.30 uh, when you can give the LADOC report. And I think Jenny, as I understand that you want to address the board at the beginning of the open session. So again, you should be there at 6.30. Okay. Uh, for Mayhood, is, is it worth just asking if anybody wants to comment on the closed session? Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 yes. Um, just in case you want to comment on the closed session uh, item, please go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Seeing no hands raised, then we'll <clears throat> go ahead and um, adjourn us to closed session. See you on the other side. Lorenzo Valley Water District Board of Directors for November 3rd. Um, can we have a roll call? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulls. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Um, there are no actions to report out of closed session this evening. Are there any additions and deletions to the agenda? Yes, Chair. Uh, first off, can we move, uh, have CTV moved uh, District Engineer Josh Wolf over to the, the panelists? And I would like to remove item 11D, uh, a schedule of Board of Directors meeting dates from the agenda. Okay. All right. Um, that brings us to oral communications. And this is the time when we have uh, comments from members of the public um, on topics uh, that lie within the jurisdiction of the district but are not on tonight's agenda. And uh, let's see, I think um, we have among our attendees, I see a hand up, uh, Jenny Gomez. Let's go ahead and let Jenny speak. And you uh, have the traditional three minutes when you want to go ahead. I'll try to make it quick. Thank you um, for the opportunity to speak. My name is Jenny Gomez. Um, I used to be on the San Lorenzo Valley um, Environmental Committee um, for the Water District. I'm on the Fish and Wildlife Advisory Commission for the county. I have been for, I think, four or five years now. And the reason I'm here tonight is I wanted to bring this a really good grant opportunity uh, for an important project that would make a really big difference in my community. Um, and that's Lompico. And that project is uh, for Lake Lompico, which is locally known as Guacamole Pond. And if you've ever seen it or come anywhere near it, you know why they call it Guacamole Pond. It is stagnant, fetid, stinky. Um, it's about a half an acre. Um, a little more. Um, it's been a blight and a hazard um, to the community for about 50 years. It has ongoing algae issues. Now, um, within the past few months, the neighbors and a few organizations got together with the RCD, the Resource Conservation District, 
Um, Jenny, Jenny um, you're kind of cutting in and out. So can you lean in towards your computer? Okay, yeah. sorry about that. Um, the project includes trail work, invasive plant removal, which has already begun. Um, we did an extensive mapping project. Uh, and like I said, County Environmental Health, uh, RCD, uh, Lompico Zayani Women's Social Club, the Valley Women's Club has agreed to sponsor this grant project. And what it's for is a aeration system for the pond. I've spoken with a number of experts and they all say that this water is going to be stagnant and stinky and yucky and a hazard. You know, and there's nothing you could do about it except an aeration system, but an aeration system would make a big difference. And so we spec'd out a system. We have a, a grant that's ready to be applied. Um, the deadline is tonight. And all we need is a plug. You guys have a um, pump station right next to it. It has a meter. It has space. Um, it takes $7 of electricity per month. It's only a 100 uh, watt uh, compressor that needs to be plugged in. We don't have any alternatives. There's no other way to, to clean up this water. Um, there's no place else to plug the machine. And um, solar is not an option either, unfortunately, because the panels would be about $6,000 and it would take 71 years for that to pay off if there was enough sun there to run the, the system, which there isn't, unfortunately. It's completely surrounded by redwood trees. So I just Please don't pull the plug on this project. All I need is a yes that we can plug it in there. And it's about $5,000 and good health and good water for the community. Um, I guess, Jenny, uh, the, the problem I have is you're asking us to make a decision and um, you're ask, kind of putting the board and, and the district manager on, on the spot. I know you've been communicating with the district manager, but we can't really make a decision on something that's not agendized. And so this is something we can, we can look into. And if you want, the board can um, talk about it. But this, this isn't really something where we can um, just make a decision on it like this based on an oral presentation. Um, in oral communications. So would, it would be helpful if you told me what, what you wanted us to, to do. If I can go ahead and submit the grant tonight. And then if you could, you know, at some later date, um, you know, within the next month or a couple of weeks, you know, agree to that. Otherwise, the grant can be pulled. They're not going to be considered until December. So there's still several weeks where, you know, if if you agree, um, you know, we can move forward with it. And and then if you don't, um, the grant application can be pulled. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's really, you know, we only meet every two weeks. So you're really kind of putting us in a bind here. I, I, I promise I'll talk to, to Rick about it, but I guess um, the one thing I would recommend is to see whether the grant could be revised in such a way that, that you bring electrical, uh, you know, off of, there's obviously electrical up there if we have electric, that you create your own electrical outlet, essentially, that you control and deal with. But other than that, I think I, I think my legal counsel is going to bonk me on the head in a minute here if I talk any more about this because we really can't have discussions of things that are not agendized. I, I I sense the urgency in your voice, but this this is not you know it's not something we can do for you tonight. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, with that, uh, let's see. Any other comments from members of the public? Seeing none, um, we come to the president's report, and I have uh, two. First, um, I just want to draw attention to two letters that are at the back of the packet as informational material. And these are letters from SDRMA, which is essentially our insurance provider, congratulating our management and staff for their proactive risk management and loss prevention that resulted in no property liability or workman comp claims that were paid out in 20, 
122. And um, this shows a lot of attention to working safely, which is great for everybody. But also just from the standpoint of, of the district, this is also a benefit to all of us because it means that um, the because of these efforts, it saves the district money in terms of reducing our annual, annual contributions in terms of essentially insurance premiums. So thank you to staff and, and recognizing their good, good efforts. Bob, did you want to comment on that? Yes, no, it's really great. And have they committed to reducing our premium? Because they raised it pretty substantially based on experience over the last uh, few years. It's if you read the letter, they say you get some points. Now, whether that you know, I, <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to see whether that's you know, points. points that and twenty five cents will get you a cup of coffee or what. But color know. me skeptical. Yeah. Okay. Um, the second thing I'd like to do is to give a, a short presentation on an airborne electromagnetic survey that's going to take place. And Carly promised to put up a very short PowerPoint for me that I'm going to use to do this, just four slides long. And if you can just blow it up to the full screen there, that would be great, Carly. Um, and the reason I, I want to give people uh, uh, talk about this is, is it's, it's literally a heads up. <laughs> um, starting November 6th, for a couple of weeks, there will be a helicopter flying over the San Lorenzo Valley watershed at about 300 feet, towing uh, this instrumented loop that's about oh, 75 feet across um, that kind of looks like a gigantic uh, kid's bubble wand. And they'll be flying over areas uh, in the San Lorenzo Valley, or excuse me, in the San Lorenzo River watershed. Um, this is part of an airborne electromagnetic survey. They'll only be flying in daylight hours. There will be no flights over areas where there's concentrations of businesses or houses or really high high power um, uh, electrical lines. So we won't see them over Scotts Valley or downtown Felton. However, you might see them uh, in areas around Brookdale, on Pico and Glenwood. There's a flight line that's going to go through that area. Bean Creek, Zianti Creek, and Lockhart Gulch, and Ben Lomond, uh, Quail Hollow, and the Olympia area. Next. And what these things do is um, they the loop um, has a magnetic field uh, that's created uh, by current flowing in the loop. And that magnetic field induces a very weak electrical current in, in the ground, sort of like when you're stuck in a big MRI tube and it induces electrical uh, changes in the electrons in your body. The same thing is happening underground. And these penetrate down to a depth of about a thousand feet. And the data that we get back from this is used to create images of underground geological structures. And they can be used to map, the most important thing is being able to map aquifers. That is places where you have rocks or deposits that are coarse grained enough that you can store water in the pores between the grains, um, as opposed to impermeable rocks, uh, clay bearing rocks or rocks like the Monterey Formation, which actually block the flow of water. You can also determine the depth to the water table, connections between surface water and groundwater, and um, also places where seawater is intruding into aquifers near the coastline because the uh, seawater has different uh, conducts, uh, seawater is salty and so it conducts electricity a little bit better. And so you can actually map that. Next. This survey is being undertaken to support drought response and the implementation of the California Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. And these flights are being paid for by the California Department of Water Resources with funding that was provided by Prop 68, which the voters approved. There's no cost to us as a water district or for that matter to our local groundwater agency. And the goal is to create a statewide grid of electromagnetic surveys uh, over those groundwater basins that are in overdraft. And they haven't quite gotten to our area yet, but you can see these black lines there. They've done a lot in the Central Valley, and that's because the highest priority basins were the ones that were severely in overdraft and have already been done. Next. And the final one. Um, 
this technique was actually pioneered by one of my colleagues in uh, in this area, and one of my colleagues at Stanford, Professor Rosemary Knight, where she did it along the coast near Watsonville in the Pajaro uh, Valley water area. And she, they were able to map actually where seawater was intruding into the aquifers uh, in the Watsonville area and up to uh, Aptos and Soquel because they'd been drawing down the water tables so much. Um, we proposed, uh, when I say we, I say the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, proposed flight lines in our little triangular area there that I've highlighted in the map at left um, to better understand the underground structures in the San Lorenzo Valley watershed. And the main purposes when um, I kind of was the main person that, that did this, was chose them, was citing where we might site new groundwater production wells uh, within existing areas and, or rainwater infiltration basins, understanding the linkages between creeks, springs, and marshes to groundwater so that we can better understand how uh, taking down groundwater affect uh, groundwater dependent ecosystems and fisheries, and figuring out the characteristics of shallow rock formations uh, that might be contributing to some of the private well owners having problems with their shallow wells in the Monterey Formation up in the Lockhart Gulch area. Um, and so I just wanted to let you know that this is what was happening. It might otherwise be alarming to see these uh, helicopters flying over at low elevations carrying this loop right over the ground. It's nothing that's harmful. Um, and, in, and eventually in a year, we should have some really interesting sort of cross sections that show us, uh, help us understand the geology. Okay, so that's that. Um, I would now like to go on to the first uh, bit of new business, which is the Lompico Assessment District Annual Report. Rick? Yeah, and I do believe Tony Norton, the chair, uh, will be here to uh, present this time. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and um, allow Tony to speak. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, great. Well, I, I didn't know that I was going to be presenting it. So, um, but did I was um, I have to say that we are really excited to be presenting this. And ha, um, has everybody on the the board had the opportunity to read it? Um, to read the the report. Yes. Uh, yes, it was in the board packet, and we read it. Great. Then you'll notice that um, we every uh, all of the funds that will be flowing in to um, to support the projects um, have it, it's already been spent. So we'll we'll continue, of course, to pay, and and the money will still come out of our tax um, at the same time as I presented in our tax bill. But that, um, but but it's um, it's all been spent, and you. The, I think we did a great job in the report of explaining how it was spent, and we are we're proud, and we're we're so appreciative of all the support that we were given by um, by Rick Rogers and his team, and Holly, and Kendra, the, the, and Stephanie Hill. They, they were all um, so supportive. So um, we'll still, of course, stay involved. There's one project that still needs to happen, but um, that needs still needs to be completed. There's um, lots of steps um, that, as Rick has explained before we can get to that point, that it's on, you know, on already been approved the entire project. So that's the inter tie um, booster. And um, I, you know, it's a long report, so I won't go into everything. We do have. It's it's pretty self-explanatory, yes. So, are, does anybody have any questions? Well, let let I see Rick has his hand up, so let's let Rick make a comment, and then we'll go to the board. Great. Thank you, uh, Chair. 
Yes, um, you know, we're asking the board tonight to um, review uh, this report, receive it, and accept uh, the annual report from the LADOC committee chair. Um, uh, post uh, this report on the LADOC page of, of the district's website, we have a section dedicated um, uh, to LADOC, hold uh, questions and answer um, discussion. You know, it was another very successful year. Um, a lot of the or the storage tank projects did come to completion. As Tony stated, there are two projects left on the project list. One has been awarded bid that we have probably a year out of pipe delivery, and that is the mainline replacement along Ziani Drive up to the Lumpico Booster. And the second one is the uh, Lumpico service lines from the main to the meter. There was a pro excuse me. There was a project to replace um, those uh, service lines, and uh, we opt to uh, do that by force account. District staff at this time are um, replacing those on an as-needed basis. the uh, The rate of failure uh, has slowed down considerably with the replacement of the, the PRV stations that were giving very high pressure to the service lines that um, were rupturing these service lines. However, these service lines still need to be replaced. Uh, they were unfortunately uh, installed with a material that was very new to the industry um, that did not have a very long uh, life expectancy, was not known at the time when, when Lampico um, put those in. Uh, and it was done uh, system-wide. In fact, we even had some of those, not as many. Uh, City of Santa Cruz had uh, several thousand that they put in that they had to replace. So it was industry-wide that those service lines had to be replaced. So we're doing those by force account. Uh, we can do it a little cheaper. And, you know, we have expensed um, all of the, the, uh, the funds from the uh, assessment district. But all in all, it has been... Uh, a great uh, experience with the Lumpico folks uh, on the consolidation. They're valued customers of the district and uh, we are supplying them with a safe bottle, wholesome uh, water, a very good water quality. And um, uh, it's been a, a great relationship. And with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, the chair. Okay, thank you for adding that clarification. Um, Bob, you are our liaison with the LADOC committee, so I'll go ahead and start with you if you have any questions or comments. Um, yes, thank you. I think, you know, I'm sort of recently been appointed to that position, so I don't have a lot of history on the specific activities of the, of the LADOC um, group, but I know that they've been working very hard in this, and I think the this report as well as previous reports uh, indicate that. Um, I, I do have some um, personal comments from a board point of view that I can reserve uh, for later, but as the member of the LADOC uh, board, board liaison for the LADOC, I wanted to um, thank Tony and the entire team for their work, their dedication. It's been a long um, journey to where we are now. I think there's four years left on the tax roll for the assessment. So we're, I think, over the, the midpoint. And um, I'm very glad to see that these projects are uh, at the stage that they're at. Okay. Um, let's see if any other members of the board have uh, any comments or questions before I go back it sounds like Bob would like to elaborate more later, but let me yep. go to the rest of the board first. Jamie? I, I would just congratulate the um, district staff and the um, Lum Pico um, residents for the commitment to this, because, I mean, it's been years, and these, these kinds of, you know, partnerships, take years. Um, it takes years to make these kinds of decisions to raise the money to go through environmental processes. And so we appreciate, you know, your patience and your good partnership for all of these years. Um, and, you know, would that it were that every consolidation uh, can have this kind of a, a happy ending, because I know, you know, we're, we're going to be on this track with our, our friends in, in uh, the our various Boulder Creek communities for a while. So um, I, I, I love that we have a model 
that um, has led to some success here. Uh, anybody else from the board? Mark, Jeff? Nope. Okay. Uh, then let me just go back out to the public first and then I'll get back to you, Bob. Okay. Uh, any other member of the public want to uh, make a comment? Except I'm sure Tony is out there blushing from all the praise, but uh, we'll come back and uh, let Bob go ahead and uh, make whatever other comments or questions he wants to do. Yeah, I think there are also some things that we can learn from this experience, and I hope that we um, apply those lessons to the consolidations going forward. Um, I think we've ended up at a good spot, but there was a time in this consolidation process where things were not going particularly well. The, the board had sat on its hands for a couple of years relative to getting the project started, and during that time, costs escalated significantly. My, my hope is that for Bracken Bray and Forest Springs, whatever um, and, and anybody else we consolidate with, um, that, that this board um, will immediately initiate projects and, and not wait like that. Um, and I think it's also incumbent upon the, the groups that are um, working on consolidation to make sure that those kinds of uh, assurances are built into the agreement. Um, I remember specifically being at a board meeting in 2017, 26, no, 2017, where one of the board members said, well, you know, if we run out of money, we'll just go back to you guys and get more. Um, th this was th th this was anathema to the spirit that I think Lompico wanted to enter into, and certainly I think the vast majority of the community. So I, while I'm glad we've got to where we are, let, let's make sure that we do a little bit better on the next one in terms of getting the projects going. I also had a question, Rick, about what is meant by maintenance um, on the service line, because from my perception, we're already out of money anyway, but we are installing the, the line down Zianti. That's basically <clears throat> being paid for by the, by the community at large. Um, so we still have the service lines to do, and I, I'm just not sure what maintenance means. It means force account labor, basically, Bob. Well, does, we does, that mean, does that mean that we wait for the service line to fail meaning that we cause disruption to our customers slash owners' lives to replace, or are we doing it at a reduced pace where maybe we do 50 a year or, you know, 100 a year or something like that? I, I'm not sure what forced labor means in that context. We do it, usually they start to leak, not total failure, you know, catastrophic failure or the customer's out of water. Um, usually they start to leak and then we schedule and, and go out. We go out rather quickly because when they start to leak, there is a, a, a catastrophic failure coming. They go um, fast. And you know, no matter if we do it, you know, if we do do it um, uh, scheduled wise and do it, we would still disrupt service, but we would be able to notice customer a little um, while, you know, several yeah. days before, instead of 24 hours before that we were going to turn water off to that individual. Because it takes, so we dig down to the corp stop. Um, and turn off, um, and we don't turn the whole street off. Usually, right. Under, understand. Um, so, um, are we able to do these without having to incur any kind of overtime or off hours um, labor? That is, are these leaks happen um, slowly enough that allows us to do all of this without any um, unnecessary cost or any? Um, off hours disruption to uh, customer service? You know, it's a, it's a little bit of both, but we do do full cost accounting of all work up in Lumpico. And even with some overtime, we're still putting those, uh, replacing those service lines below the recent um, bidded prices we've got on uh, some of our other projects we've compared the two. Um, there's still a pretty good savings by doing an under force account labor doing it in the maintenance department. Yeah, no, I, I think doing it under labor is is perfectly fine. Um, I guess the only thing I was potentially talking about is doing it on, on more of a schedule. I guess the last question I have in this is, how, are you keeping track of the failures that are occurring? And 
are those failures accelerating? My, my understanding is there's a point at which this pipe is going to knee over and you're going to have a lot of um, failures that are going to be happening in a relatively short period of time. Um, are we are we seeing that at all? We are since we've lowered the pressure when we, when we replaced all the regulator valves. We brought that pressure down considerably, and that was excelling the the failure and also kind of a more of a bursting, you know, not just a leak but an actual right. catastrophic. Yeah, catastrophic. Yeah. Right. So since we put the regulators in um, the mainline regulators, it slowed it way down. Uh, we do keep, you know, a list, and I. I don't have that in front of me, and I can make sure James gets that in his next monthly report uh, of uh, you know how many we've changed the date, the type. We're even keeping track of material, everything, so we have a good understanding um, uh, exactly what's going on out there. And is the material readily available to do these replacements when they do happen? I know we're having problems with some kind of parts. I'm hopefully not. Yes, we keep a pretty good inventory of the three quarter, I mean, of the one inch poly pipe sizes, and we're doubling up stock on all of our brass. So, so far, we've been able to keep ahead of the uh, material procurement issues you know, on that material. I, I want to make sure that we understand that, that the board understands, the community understands that that assessments district had these service lines replacement as a commitment. And until that is done, this project is not complete. That is our obligation to make sure that that happens. And while I would like to see that happen faster, that's that's my objective. Um, let's let's run for a little while and see how it works with the slow leaks that were occurring so far. Thank you. Any other comments from members of the board? Uh, okay, then what I would like to do is um, move that the board receive and accept the annual report from the LADOC committee chair and post the report on the LADOC page of the district website. I'll second that. Sure. Thank you. Um, any comments, questions about the motion in front of us from members of the board? Um, any comments from members of the public? Okay. If not, can we just take a vo voice vote? All in favor? Aye. Yes. yes. And all opposed? Okay. Abstentions? Okay. Unanimously passed. Okay. Next item on the agenda is uh, the recommendation to award construction uh, for the Foreman Pipeline Access Trail Rehabilitation Project. Right, and the district engineer uh, chair will present this item to the board, Josh. Thank you, Rick. As I believe everyone here knows, because we've uh, talked about this a few times, after the CZU fires, we moved quickly to get water back into the lion treatment plant. The fastest way to do that was to get the foreman intake back online because it's the closest one. In that effort, we brought in a local contractor, Jan Vandersteen, who did tremendous work for us. And as part of his work, he cut essentially an access trail on which to place pipe or in which to place pipe. This project is the remaining piece of the FEMA funded project, which is restoration of that area, or at least providing permanent erosion control. We want to ensure that we're not creating risk for anyone downslope or towards Foreman Creek. To that end, the district published an RFP for design, which was won by Foreman or Friar and Loretta, excuse me. They did the design. We published the RFP for construction. The first time we published it, we only got one bid, so we were not able to open because one bid's not competitive. We republished the RFP and did a fair amount of outreach and received seven bids this time. All, most of them from fairly large companies as opposed to some of these smaller companies that we've been seeing bid on our projects more recently. The low bid was from McGuire and Hester. And I have provided in my memo to the board 
a recommendation that the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with McGuire and Hester for construction of this project. With that, I will take questions. Okay. Jamie, I'll start with you. Um, I don't really have a lot of questions about this. I think this is the necessary next step. And so, all right, well, well, we'll just go on, uh, Bob. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks. I I was looking at this. I I was actually intrigued by the um, uh, the material that was that was there. That was the uh, what was it? The Tesco, the Teco mat, Teco mat. And I went and looked uh, at it. You know, you can find anything on YouTube now. <laughs> so I went and took a look at it. It's pretty interesting stuff. Is this kind of the um, for the new standard for us for permanent erosion control, as opposed to any other um, method? Not really. We don't necessarily have a specific technique that we use on a regular basis. What we do is assess what we what the constraints are of a site and what the risks are, and determine the appropriate methodology based on that. In this case, we're attempting to restrain fairly large debris. Techomat is the, the best choice. And it, okay, so for this particular item, um, it, it's the best choice. I would would do we think that this would be the same for uh, the Peavine or Clear Creek um, pipes? Would, would the same kind of approach be be used? Without getting into details of a, another much larger project, this particular product is likely to be useful in several of the situations that we will encounter in that project. Okay. I'm reluctant to no, I give you any numbers about how yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it, it is a well understood and um, appears to be very useful. Uh, the YouTube I was looking at was at a much steeper slope than the foreman. And it, it, they, they seem to be really happy with it. It was in Switzerland, of course. But, you know, yes, the Teco mat has become, over the last 10 or 12 years, a fairly standard technique and a fairly standard material used <laughs> for retention of slopes. Caltrans loves it. Yeah, I they use it a lot. Do. And are we going to be doing the same drilling into the hillside and mortar and the bolts and the whole bit? In certain locations, yes. The anchoring system, again, is very site and situation dependent. In this case, we will be using soil nails or anchors mm -hmm. in certain locations. Okay. Um, how does this do with respect to fire? If the fire came through um, again? How, like, how any, like any other galvanized steel product, it's fairly immune to fire until you get a very intense fire that sticks around for a while. Forest and fires with their nature of just moving through an area are unlikely to damage it. And are we going to be able to um, more readily keep this area clear of debris um, and any kind of, you know, file, fire um, fuel by having this down? Does, does that help us do that? The two are not related particularly. Okay. okay, great. Thank you. Mark, I realized I should have gone to you first as chair of the engineering department committee, but um, did you have comment or question? Uh, two comments. Uh, seven bids. Great job, uh, Josh and the engineering department staff in getting seven bids and contractors that are, are reputable. Uh, the second is on the uh, the winning bidder, McGuire and Hester. Um, I've uh, supervised projects of theirs before. They're a very good contractor. Uh, they perform well for my clients on other projects. So I uh, applaud the fact that we're able to get them. Good job. Thank you. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Jeff, did you have anything you wanted to ask or <laughs> Um it looks like a very good project to me. Uh, like Bob, I was fascinated by the uh, 
Tecomat substance. And uh, I've had opportunities to stabilize other types of hillsides, and this looks like, like something I might have used if I had known about it. <laughs> yeah, me too. Mark, did you want to pop in again? Yes, I do realize I have uh, one or two uh, cost related questions. Uh, Rick, is this cost budgeted? This um, and is, then is it? This is a FEMA project, so in a sense, it, it, it is budgeted, um, and um, it'll be a ninety okay. percent uh, FEMA, uh, ten percent district uh, contribution out of the fifteen million, right? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Are there any questions from our two uh, attendees? Would anybody like to make a motion about this? Sure, I'll move that um, we direct the district manager to enter into a contract with McGuire and Hester for construction activities related to the Foreman Pipeline Access Trail Rehabilitation Project. Uh, in conformance with the McGuire and Hester bid of seven hundred and sixty-four thousand nine hundred and fifty-nine and eighty cents exact. Is there a second? I'll second that. Thank you for putting that together, um, Josh. All right. Can we have a uh, roll call vote, Holly? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. We uh, move to our last item of new business, the multiple user variance renewals for 2022-23. And we do have the finance manager here tonight to present this item to the board. Kendra. All right, so uh, it was recommended that the board of directors review this memo and approve a one year variance from multiple user status for the pro following property owners. Uh, a list of the account numbers is provided. Uh, basically what this is, is um, customers that are multiple user status uh, qualify for an exemption are charged a five eighth monthly basic fee as a single family dwelling. While those who are multiple users are charged one inch monthly basic service fee. Um, customers are allowed to apply for a variance if they are not renting out the second dwelling unit in which we would, instead of charging the one inch fee, we would um, drop them down back to the five eighths fee. Uh, so basically this is just a, another one year uh, approval for the variance. I can take questions. For once, it's not my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm ungrateful. <laughs> nice to hear, actually. Um, okay. Uh, Jeff, you're with me on the budget and finance. Would you like to comment on this? It makes sense to me. I, you know, if you've got a two person or two unit uh, with only one person or only one unit occupied, uh, there's, you know, it just makes sense. And I don't think it has any significant impact. I, how many accounts do we have like this? Um, well, you can see at the bottom, I don't, the impact is only $8,300. Yeah, it's about $8,300. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is de minimis as far as I'm concerned. Right. Um, that it sounds seems only fair to the to the customers. Yeah, I, I think it's twenty nine out of four hundred and seventy two multiple user accounts. Yeah, this seems only fair. Any other questions, comments from the board? Mom, I did have a question about the two um, accounts that were removed from there. Um, I think due to the fact that the uh, ownership changed and likely the previous owners didn't tell them about this to get the um, paperwork in on time. 
is, is the paperwork being on time, is that a state law? Or is that a, is that a board uh, level um, policy? Um, I, I'm not sure about the state law, but we do send out letters. We send out two notices um, and giving them the chance to respond and fill out the form. Um, I do know that it is like they, the verbiage on the form is they're signing it under penalty of perjury and all that, um, you know, stating that, you know, they are not renting it out and uh, things like that. So we do give them two chances to send us back the form. And if we don't receive them, then that's when we remove them from the list. And in the case of those two where the homes turned over, did it go to the new owners and they, they de declined to return it? Um, I'd have to look at the specifics of it. I'm not sure in this case, um, uh, the, our, one of our customer service representatives uh, put together this list. So I would have to double check on the specifics for these two accounts. Um, but I can get that back to you. But if it is okay, a new, if it goes to a new owner, we do send out a form to the new owners as well when it changes ownership. Okay, so the two the two owners there, they're not complaining about the situation that they have right now, the fact that they're now being charged for multiple uh, families. I I mean, I would have to check the specifics of the two accounts that are being removed. I like I said, I don't know in particular, those two. So, so I'd like to agree with Bob here that, that this needs to be looked into because we don't want to have a couple of accounts that are, you know, trapped in some catch-22 thing here that's, that's uh, you know, essentially unfair. So we should, you know, take a look at this and make sure these people are being uh, reasonably treated. Right. Yeah. No. When when they when we when they change ownership and they come up as the multiple user status, we we send out the form allowing them to allowing them to sign for the variance if they are not renting out the second unit. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that is happening during the uh, opening of a new account process. Yeah, they they may not have understood it. They may have. I I just was curious, basically, whether it was an issue or not. Thank you. Rick? Yeah, this is um, District Ordinance 43 and 47 that uh, allows us to uh, charge the multiple user and has the variance uh, information in the ordinance. Um, this is not a state law. That's what I thought, but I didn't I didn't have the ordinance number. Well, it, it, seems, to me, it seems to me that if we're sending out uh, letters on the change of ownership and therefore also the change of the account name we should be catching those those people yeah i'm just hoping it's it's clear what what it is it may you know if people haven't lived in this kind of situation they just may not know what it means but but yeah I, if we've given them notice that works yeah it, it explains it in the letter that we send okay great thank you uh, would a board member, uh, well, let's see, are there any questions or comments from members of the public? No? Would a board member like to make a motion regarding the resolution? I'll move the resolution to approve a one-year var variance from the multiple user status for the property owners listed on the uh, resolution. Thank you. I'll second that. Um, can we have a roll call vote, Holly? President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Hulse? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, next <clears throat> are Consent agenda, um, we just have one item, the board uh, minutes for uh, 1020. Anybody want to pull this from the consent agenda? Hearing nobody, how about uh, from the public? Okay, then we will consider the consent agenda adopted. Um, district reports, Rick tells me he has no district manager report for tonight. Um, there are no written communications. Um, 
I already covered the informational material in my president's report. So that blessedly uh, brings us to 16, but Rick has his hand up. So I, I just wanted to state on the two correspondents from SDRMA, one point uh, reflects to 1% discount of the total premium. I think we're eligible up to 10 points for no vehicle accidents, for a safety program and so forth. So it, it, it uh, does uh, give us a discount on our total bill. Okay. Woo -hoo. That's great. Well, 1% is better than a stick in the eye. So. Oh, yeah, no, oh, I, 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 I'm, <laughs> we, we, we count nickels, don't we? Okay. All right. With that, uh, without objection, I will adjourn this meeting. Good night, all. Good night.